told by last he went to college and he, he stole some shirts. Came I asked the I asked the uh, they said if he, they got him for grand larceny. So I'm thinking grand larceny, that boy is some real some real deep stuff. Now yeah, I didn't know. So I asked the, the police or somebody I said, What's grand larceny? Anything over fifty dollars. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> I thought the boys were <laughs> robbing banks, you know, <laughs> grand larceny. Because, <laughs> you know, I watched Edward G. Robinson and James Cagney and all them guys. I thought, grand larceny. So <laughs> I bailed him out. I only had, I only had probably three or $400 to my name in the bank. And when he called, I had never dealt with the police like that ever. And so they say, yeah, well, if you bail him out, it'll be like $275 or something like that. And I ain't got but 300 And I'm like, okay. So I bail him. I go down there and bail him out. So <laughs> we, we're getting out of jail. And so he, 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 he do that walk where, you know, he going to walk way over here. So he walking like this, trying to get down there. I got over there, and on GP, they wasn't locking you up them days. I just swung on him, Mondre. Whoo! <laughs> I figured you got to do that. I ain't his mama like, oh, baby, did they, did they mistreat you while you was in there? Did they hurt you? Oh, is my baby okay? I said, I'm going to knock you out because I want you to get this in your mind. And I told him, you ain't going to jail. And I got to spend my last $275 on you. This ain't happening. I don't think he's been to jail since. But the other thing, <laughs> yeah, well, I figured you're supposed to hit him on GP. That's part of the bailout package. Punch him. You think going to ride all the way back to Spencer with me? Just we going to chat, man? I'm going to whoop you in a field somewhere so that we can have it noted that I was a father today. So then I find out that if you bail them out, you got to get lawyers for them. I called him. I said, I, ain't ha I only had $275 to get him out. We ain't got no money. Can we do the, y'all you know, don't know the system, do the public defender? They said, no, sir, because if you got enough money to get him out, you got enough money for a lawyer. So now I got to go $1,200 to get him a lawyer. I let him know it. <laughs> Amen. But for whatever reason, sometimes children are provoked to steal, to break, to enter. They go have sex because we provoke them. Let me tell you how provoking works. My mother, this is not about me, she accused me of smoking when I wasn't snow. And she told me not to smoke, but my father accused me of smoking when I wasn't smoking. That's provoking. Provoking works like this. If you come home and your spouse or significant other say, where you been? And you say, thus and so, and they say, you a lie. <laughs> Guess what? Next time you come home, you're going to lie. You might. You're being provoked. How do we provoke our children, fathers, when we don't provide for them, when we don't find out what it is they want to do in life? Because for many of us, we just want to hear, I just want to get out of high school and work. And we're like, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. But sometimes they want to do something, and they want other things that require fathers to make sacrifices. We live in a world where the father can always say, I'm providing food, clothing, and shelter, and that's enough. But our children, fathers, and we forget, I didn't know this all the time, but they are special. And sometimes they need a special time with father to, to, so they can breathe out what it is they want to do. And I'm going to tell you the reason why I know this is because the Bible says so. Mothers never get kids out of their breast. Pro football, hi, mom. You know, daddy sitting right there on the couch. You know, he the one. 
paying, paying the bill. He's sitting there. You know, he might be drinking some suds, and she's here over there. That's my baby. Hi, Mom. You know, well, what about Daddy? In some cases, Daddy ain't there. But it's always, hi, Mom. But see, fathers were supposed to step up. I'm not blaming a woman for that. But fathers somehow were supposed to step up. There are many fathers because the woman decides you ain't coming because you ain't paid enough child support. They give up. Now, I don't have the answer to that. But sometimes it is pay the child support. Sometimes they're in a place where they can't pay like they're supposed to. But guess who gets caught in the crossfire? Now, I'm not blaming the mother for standing your ground. But fathers, you're going to have to do something. And you can't be creepy and be at the school looking through the gate and snatching them. But you're going to have to find a way because that's your child. And as I was saying, I believe at the beam of God's going to ask you, well, why didn't you pursue your child? Now that they're 18... And they're getting ready to sign a contract. You out there, hey there, that's my boy, that's my girl. And they resent you. They don't want to have nothing to do with you. How do fathers provoke their children when they mistreat their mama? And this is important. If mama's in there crying because father done been out, been, been out, them boys will fear you for a minute. But after a while, they look in the mirror and they see hair on their chest. They start looking at you and they start saying to themselves, you ain't going to do my mama like that no more. And out of that resentment, many of them will mimic their father. Be drunkards, womanizers, unin interested in religious stuff. So it's important that fathers know that the Bible says don't provoke your children to wrath. Now we think that's you keep pushing them, keep pushing them. But you keep pushing them when the boy ain't had a new pair of shoes in three years. His toes is, is, is breaking through. Or the daughter. And that's how they're provoked. And that's why some slickster in, in eighth grade, ninth grade can come up to him and blow kisses at him and show him his car, and now they're pregnant. And you want to go shoot him and kill him. You touch my daughter. Well, she was provoked. Your drunkenness provoked her. Because she's asking the question, when did I get too big to sit on your lap? It ain't got nothing to do with weight. But somewhere, mama let us lay in her breast, but you won't let us sit in your lap. Even men. Pop, when did I get so big that I can't sit on your lap? We're not talking physical, but I can come to you and talk to you. And those things is what provoke us to go and do it a way that's ungodly. So we need fathers that don't provoke. But they encourage us in the things of the Lord. I'm almost done. And it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, son of my pain, but his father called him Benjamin, son of my right hand. This is the scripture from Genesis 35 and 18 about Jacob, and Jacob had 12 sons. And as we know, they uh, make up the children of Israel. Well, Rebecca, in having his last son, she names him Benoni, which means she named him. Out of my pain, I'm having you. But Jacob, his father, says, uh-uh. His name is not going to be Benoni, out of your pain. His name is going to be Benjamin. He's going to be the son of my right hand, meaning he's, I'm going to give him power. I'm going to give him authority. He's going to be in covenant with me. So we need fathers that insulate 
you from identity theft. When you get married and you have children, or if you're not married and you have children, they're supposed to take on somebody's name. I personally don't believe in all of this. I'm going to keep my last name and take my new name, so I miss uh, uh, Catherine Smith Henderson Johnson. I mean, what's the point? What are you trying to prove? What are you saying? Now, if you divorce all them times, that makes sense from a biblical perspective. But you, you are married. Your reluctance to take on his name reflects an attitude in your heart that says, I will never come under his headship. But it's important what your father call you. And your father calls you not only by words, but he calls you from disposition of how he, he talks to you. Amen. It's important. If a father or a mother or somehow the child feel like that I was born out of their pain, and kids are very intuitive and can pick it up, so the whole time y'all got together, the relationship was in pain. Or maybe there was some other situation that was going on that you couldn't talk to them about. That child, be it male or female, at some point, they're going to need to know, how is my father? Or what would my father think? Or how would my father, what power would he give me? See, because what they begin to see to the person who's saying that you are part of my pain, they begin to say, I don't look like you. Then I want to see the other person who's got the power. Because if you got the pain, then somebody else had the power. Because this person with the power had to inflict pain on you. I want to know who he, who he or she is like. So it's important that the father names his children. And he named them, their na he gives them their name, and then he has a good name. See, some of y'all don't know nothing about this. Now, when you tell them, I want to buy this house, this car, I want to buy this, this piece of wood. And you say, well, here's my name. They be like, man, you better come on with something better. Than well, it's a good name. The Bible says a good name is to be preferred over a lot of things. And what a father does is give you a good name. When, when somebody says, well, <clears throat> my name is uh, Smith, and I'm Bubba, uh, 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 Lonnie Smith's daughter, then somebody's supposed to know, oh, oh, well, shoot. Uh, we expect you to act in a certain way. And uh, if, if you say you're going to take this piece of bubble gum and pay us tomorrow, you're going to pay us because you are Lonnie Smith's child. But what the father does, if he's not in God, he doesn't have a good name to give. And that's how we got in this situation. You got to have collateral. You got to put this up and that out. Because somewhere our fathers lost their good name. And so... Fathers are the ones that help us with our identity as a man. If my father's a godly man and he's taught me those principles like Abraham, then I know that if I'm in certain areas of life, my father wouldn't like this. I not only, uh, I may not have as much respect for God. I know it sounds weird for God, but I got a whole lot of respect for my father. God can see me going into motels, and I don't feel no shame. But if my father saw me coming out of there, Lord, I wouldn't know what to say. Because it's a father that gives you your name. Used to be a time when the father says, you are a Brown. You are a Jones. You better act like it. And what he meant was, if you mess up my name, I'm going to find a switch and come after you. 
because he was determined. He gives us. And see, the reason people can get on Jerry Springer, and even though he ain't on no more, but still get on the court shows and show the part of their life they shouldn't show, is because they ain't got no fathers. They not only don't go to church, they ain't got no father. Because a father would tell you, if you get on that ABC, CBS, and you up there abuse you and him fighting over some rent, how much, how much is the car? I'll pay you for it. My God, how much is the rent? It, it, principal, nothing. You ain't getting them. <laughs> in my name. And, you know, mom and all of them, they, they, they get to talking about the child up there trying to sue this fool on TV. And, and she looked trifling, and he do too. And he looked trifling, she do. Your father would be like, they'd be ring, ding, ding, ring, a ding, ding. Let me tell you what, what they owe you. His daddy, it's $500. He'd be like, I'll do it. Get off that TV. Don't you get in that camera. You got to come back to First Baptist of Shepherd's Fold and all these people looking at us and you put us out there like that. They used to. Father, didn't they? Didn't they? Didn't they? Didn't they? <laughs> they didn't want you showing yourself because you had to come to the church. And he was sitting in the gate. He was, if he wasn't on the deacon board, he was close to it. He didn't want nobody knowing that you was out there acting a fool, and he, yo, you his child. <laughs> and they would tell you in a minute, <laughs> you know who I am. They try to remind you. Y'all don't know nothing about it. Y'all just say, well, Pastor, that ain't the way we do it. Somebody take, I'm going to take it to the court. Whatever. If you'd had a father, you'd had a father that you'd listen to, he'd have tried to talk to you. <laughs> Save you some embarrassment. But that's all right. Come on, we're about done here. Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abram in all things. And Abram said unto his elder servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, the God of earth, that, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell, but thou shalt go into my country, to my kindred, take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said unto him, Perhaps the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? And Abraham said unto him, Beware that thou bringest not my son thither again. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house, took me from whose house? My father's house, and from the land of the kindred, which spake unto me, and swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. And if the woman be not willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this oath. Only bring not my son thither again. And the servant put his hand on the thigh of Abraham his master and squared him concerning that matter. Now, the father is important because he's supposed to help you with your choice. And every one of us know, especially when daddy tried to pick a boyfriend for us, we're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> if you try to pick a girlfriend too, we'd be like, no, no. But the father, a good father, is supposed to be part of the choice. He's supposed to be able to recognize. Now, daughter, son, why is you taking up with that girl? You know, her people's, them people's, they be on the porch and they be <laughs> doing stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah he, I mean, he may say some stuff we can't say in church, but, you know, why is you taking up with that girl? See, we got... We didn't got too far away from the root. I was walking down the street, and some man called me on the porch. Hey, boy, come here. And I came in, and he said, boy, what's your name? I told him, he said, who are your people? And when I told him who my people were, he knew. Because folk want to know who your people was because they knew who you was about to be through your people. It wasn't none of this where well, my people is wild, buck wild and crazy, but I'm going to be the good one. They were like, no. You got the same wild Mohegan blood they got in them. 
They want to know who your people was. This is what Abraham was saying. Don't marry my son off to some wild Canaanite person. A godly father is supposed to help you to say, he a Canaanite, he a Trocolodite, he a Midianite, he a homosexualite, he a bisexualite. He's something, something wrong with that boy. Something wrong with that girl. He can look. Y'all think mama the only one. Oh, she's a good girl. I want him to get married. I want to, oh, you know, daddy, he be looking at him. He can tell the way he come in the house. He can almost read through him like, uh. Daddy expect him to be a little nervous. Supposed to be. He ain't supposed to come in there overconfident. Voice deeper than daddy's. <laughs> I have a, yeah, I have a back. <laughs> daddy looking at him. He tall. You go pick somebody three feet taller than daddy, too. <laughs> oh, y'all ain't got to say nothing. Well, yeah, that's what godly fathers do. They look them up and down. Y'all think mama the only one can look. But if you had a guy, he looking them up and down. He can tell when a boy comes sparking down the street. Boy, you ain't cut no grass, you ain't nothing. Done. Every time I see you coming around my house, what you, what, what you looking for? He know all the Eddie Haskells. <laughs> and y'all think daddy can't pick women too, but daddy can. Yeah. He can look at him and say, son, <laughs> like, like old daddy told Harpo, <laughs> son, with that thing, and you, you look like you done been beat up there. <laughs> Oprah, Winf Oprah Winfrey beat you up, didn't she? <laughs> no, daddy, no, daddy. Daddy can look at her and say, son, that's too, that's too much woman for you right there. <laughs> he can. You slow. Boy, you slow. You, uh, you wake up, you don't know. That woman right there, that woman been down the road. <laughs> you, don't, you, you, you don't want her. <laughs> now, I'll take her. If your mama wasn't in my life, I'll take her. That's what daddies talk. Y'all think they will. <laughs> I'll take her. If it wasn't for your mama, I'll take her. But you, you can't handle that kind of woman. <laughs> Ask some brothers. Daddies don't do well in talking to you about the birds and bees. Other than you bet not let them. That's all daddies know. You bet not <laughs> if I catch somebody, you know. <laughs> Cause they embarrassed by it, because they know how they roll up on mama. <laughs> Well, let me move on. Okay. <laughs> they knew wasn't nobody there to stop them. That's all I'm trying to say. Ain't no indictment on mama. There wasn't nobody there to stop them. But we need daddies to help us with our choices. Jesus didn't just pick you by himself. Every plant that my father planted. It's God that helped Jesus to pick you. He done the dying. It was God and through the Holy Ghost that you was picked. That's why you was chosen in lots of call. And that's what fathers do. And I'm not saying it's easy, man, to talk to your teenage sons or daughters because and grown, they, they get to the place they don't want to hear you. But that's why he sent the spirit of Elijah. You're supposed to keep praying. It's something about when your grown kids and your kids, grown kids especially, they know that you're praying for them. It has even greater impact to know their mama. Them. They expect mama to do it. She, she, they saw mama pray, for, pray all the time when they was kids because you wasn't coming up to speed, men. So seeing mama crying and all that don't mean nothing. But if they see daddy, daddy, daddy praying, daddy crying, you done upset daddy crying because of you, they'd be like, oh, shoot. I better, ooh, daddy. Because they don't expect daddy to get all wimpy. And what's, what got you all stretched out, daddy? One of my boys, daddy, I don't care how grown they are. Let a grown man, he can be an alcoholic. 
knowing that his daddy is praying for him. He may be mad, but he, he can't. It'll blow his mind. He praying, daddy? Somebody say, daddy, crying and praying for you. He'll be like, oh, shoot. It makes an impact. So, those of you who don't have a father that you can bring your choice to, God will give you somebody other than your own intuition. You need somebody. Uncle Bubba. Or cousin somebody. And don't always go to a female. I'm, I'm about done here. You're going to go to another female. Somebody won't live their life vicariously through you. Ooh, I take him. I was back in my 60s. I take him. You know, just sit your butt down. Excuse me. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. Sit down. Trying to live their life through you. Ooh, I, ooh, I take him. You know, girl, sit down. <laughs> Tell this girl what's right. <laughs> Tell the boy what's right. The father that instructs, Solomon wrote, <coughs> excuse me, Proverbs. Fathers, we are called to be instructors. Now, I know nobody want to hear no preaching, but we're called to be instructors. Sit down. Come over. I need to talk to you. Sit down. Hey, let's sit on the porch. Sit in the living room. Meet me out at the fishing pond. I need to talk to you. We need fathers that instruct. And when fathers cease to do these things, then why does God need a father? What's the point? Because all you are is a breadwinner. And you can't, pr you can't make enough bread for them. We need fathers committed to whom they be God. In the Bible, it's plenty of places where it says, and Enoch was born, I read, and I read begot. Mahuja, and Mahuja begot Methuselah, Methuselah begot Lamech and Adam, lived 130 years, and he begot sons in his own likeness after his image. And what God is, is doing and going to do, some of it's going to be natural, but some, most of it will be spiritual. All of those men, and I'm talking to men right now, that have the power to beget, then God wants us to be accountable if nowhere else but in our prayer life and our devotional life. If fathers would just simply go back to the house of God, they will affect their families. But they got to get almost dead till they start wanting to go to the house of the Lord. If fathers want to know where all of heaven will support them, angels will come to the door and open the door and the car door and drive them. All they need to do is go back to the house of God. They ain't got to go say nothing. They ain't got to go testify. Got to go explain nothing. Just the fact that when they find out that Papa is going to church again, Daddy, Daddy going to church. It ain't Father's Day. Daddy going he there every Sunday. Them, them grown sons and daughters going to examine their life. Just like I told you, this book got power. Take it in the break place, the break room, and watch how people respond. They go to shush you, go to, they say their cuss words till they get outside the door, or whatever. You can stop traffic with this book. Care, start carrying it if you would, if you would care it to work. And this is how you showed up every day, and, and people see you, they'd be whispering. That's that girl that brings the Bible all the time. Somebody say, I'm looking for someone. You know the one that be carrying the Bible. Everybody, that, that one right there? Yeah, that's the one. This carries power. Fathers carry the same kind of power. If they go back to the house of God, if they get on their knees and pray, and it's, it's known that daddy 